For the past year, when I was off work, apart from one time in September when all eight of us in my house got COVID, I've been healthy. Even then, I actually only felt off for one day. Over those 12 months, my baby, others in my family, they had the stomach flu or various kinds of colds, but not me. Well, that is, until the day before I was to start back to work full time. On that day, I woke up with the worst sinus congestion. You know, when your nose is just raw and puffy and red. When I wrote this sermon introduction, I can honestly say I had not slept for three days straight. My nose was so stuffed up that I couldn't breathe through it. And that just kept me tossing and turning all night, every night. When I'm sleep deprived, I can't think clearly. And I don't know about you, but when I haven't slept, I'm kind of a jerk. Why in the world couldn't I have been sick a couple of weeks before starting to work? You know, when I had time to be sick. Leading up to returning to work, I intentionally prepared, not only mentally, but everything else was ready and planned. I had extra meals in the freezer, rides arranged for my kids to and from work and school, daycare was all arranged, because I'm excited to be joining the Sanctus staff team again. I love what I get to do, especially as we're in this time of rebuilding post-pandemic. But being sick and weak, it kept me from being able to give it my all. Sickness is an obstacle that is often out of our control. It was clearly a physical obstacle, but could it also have been spiritual opposition? Why is it when you step up to do what God has called you to do, the road isn't always smooth? Why did I get sick? I, I don't know. I certainly hope it was not so that I would have an opening to the sermon. <laughs> Sometimes the obstacles we face aren't as simple as a nasty cold that needs time for recovery. Sometimes the resistance is massive. Whatever its size, how should a Christian respond to opposition? This is our third week in the sermon series on the book of Ezra. This book documents the historical account of the time when Cyrus of Persia defeated the Babylonian Empire. Now, unlike the Babylonian kings before him, Cyrus allowed the captive peoples to return to their homelands. The Jewish people had been exiled to Babylon in three stages, and they returned with the permission of the Persians in three stages. Zerubbabel led the first group of 50,000 returning Israelites in 538 B.C., and they started to rebuild the temple. Today, we're taking a look at the time, that time period as it is documented in Ezra chapters 4 through 6. So just take a moment, try and find that little book and scroll over to chapter 4. Last week, we learned about what it takes to mentally and spiritually step into what the Lord is doing for his people. It's an act of trust, an act of obedience. We see in Ezra God's people responding to the prophet's call to action, the call to rebuild. They get back to rebuilding, but their excitement gets abruptly confronted with this massive opposition. Let's see how they handled it. Ezra 4, verses 1 and 2. The enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were rebuilding a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. So they approached Zerubbabel and the other leaders and said, let us build with you, for we worship your God just as you do. We have sacrificed to him ever since King Ashardan of Assyria brought us here. So at first glance, wow, what kind neighbors. They're coming over to lend a hand while there's some building going on. But the writer of Ezra, he gives us this clue. This offer to help is not to be trusted. He introduces the people as the enemies of the people of God. This group was eventually called the Samaritans. Originally, they were from the 10 tribes that were living in the north, but many nations had mixed in with them. They had the law of God and they partly served it. However, they added to it and they worshiped various idols. At this time, clearly an idol is a statue of wood or stone or metal. When I traveled with a team from Sanctus to visit our global partner in India, there were an abundance of statues at every street corner. 
on the dash of every tuk-tuk and every taxi. I'm so thankful for the learning that comes from having a global partner because I had to travel to the other side of the world to see how common idol worship is today within various faiths. I grew up in the church, so I find it hard to be drawn to the belief that worshiping a statue and then expecting something as a result. But that doesn't mean I haven't struggled with idolatry. Ken Sandy's definition of the term idol is extremely helpful. An idol is something other than God that we set our heart on. It motivates us. It masters us. It rules us. Or we trust it, we fear, or serve it. See, an idol also can be referred to as a false god or a functional god. You put it like that, and it's just easier to understand why we're drawn to false gods. Recently, in the Wednesday morning Women Connect group at the Ajax site, we completed a study called No Other Gods by Kelly Minter. She explained that the reasons why people allow a person or a possession to function as God in their life is because it helps them find identity. It meets a need. It numbs a pain. It is present when God is silent, or maybe simply it's fear that's just keeping them from being able to separate themselves from it. Is there someone or something that you are allowing to take the place of God in your life today? You can't serve Jesus plus another. So follow the example of the exiles here in our text. The Jews that had returned from Babylon, they knew that idolatry must be avoided. God commands his people to worship only him. Exodus 20 verse 3 says, you must not have any other God but me. The reason that God allowed them to be ca taken captive 70 years prior was because of their rebellion, their willingness to let God be replaced by a false God. Now, they certainly did not want to face the consequences of idolatry again. So this group of exiles, they knew they needed to stand strong against partnering with idol worshipers. Ezra 4, verse 3 says, But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the other leaders of Israel replied, You may have no part in this work. We alone will build the temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, just as King Cyrus of Persia commanded us. See, the Persian king, he granted the right to rebuild the temple only to the returnees, not to other people, but this aggravated the Samaritans. Look at verses four and five. It says, then the local residents, they tried to discourage and to frighten the people of Judah to keep them from their work. They bribed agents to work against them, to frustrate their plans. And this went on during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia, lasted until King Darius of Persia took the throne. One commentary said the local residents started a propaganda war aiming to discourage the workers, to spread disinformation. They paid off agents, counselors, so likely lawyers, politicians, who had power to use their various tactics to frustrate the rebuilding. The opposition was political, governmental, but it was also emotional, physical, and spiritual. And it lasted from Cyrus to Darius. That's over 20 years. When rebuilding God's house, opposition became a normal part of life. Each day, the people of God, they wake up to face and expect resistance. They would have gotten used to the snide remarks, the threats, the delays in their supplies arriving when they expected them. So we come to verse 6. Now, chronologically, we could skip over to chapter 5 because that is where Darius orders the rebuilding to continue. It's a little confusing here if you're a history buff and if you happen to know the dates of what king was in power when because the author, he inserts an account of opposition under Xerxes and also Artaxerxes. And those kings, they didn't reign till after King Darius, which is actually after the temple was finished. So we need to read this as if he wrote verses 1 through 5, saying, okay, the people faced opposition during the time of the rebuilding of the temple. Oh, and speaking of opposition, this reminds me, they also faced opposition during the time of rebuilding the wall. The opposition specifically included one letter sent to Xerxes, 
and then later a separate letter sent to the next king, Artaxerxes. The author is simply giving us a list of various noteworthy times of opposition. So I'll just summarize the rest of chapter 4 for us. Essentially, the local residents who are clearly enemies of God, in the letter to the king, they're accusing the Jews of rebuilding their defenses. They exaggerate what's happening. They, they say they're going to rebel against Persia, probably not going to pay taxes, and that's going to damage the treasury. And they're going to bring shame to the monarchy. They want the king to believe at the end, there's just going to be nothing left for the king. Well, the king does some research there. He looks into the Jews' history and he says, okay, yes, they are troublemakers. He responds, he orders them to stop rebuilding. The Samaritans stop them forcefully, likely bringing soldiers. What a day of great shame for the entire Jewish population. So mentioning these kings tells us that political opposition actually spanned over... 80 years. Okay, chapter 4, verse 24. It brings us back to focus on specifically the temple. We're in year 519 BC. King Darius is now the king of the Persian Empire. And as I was saying earlier, when rebuilding God's house, opposition becomes a normal part of life. If only God's people had that kind of perspective that they would just expect opposition. The problem is, the Jews they let it discourage them. And then they would just quit building for a time. Pastor John talked about this. He compared it to a traffic jam. God gets their attention by sending messengers. Ezra 5, verse 1. At that time, the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, son of Iddo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem. They prophesied in the name of God, the, in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Underline that phrase, the God of Israel who was over them. See, God was over the Israelites. They were under him. There's a New Testament verse that may be familiar to you. It tells us what else God is over. Ephesians 4 verse 6 says, One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This language reminds us God is sovereign he is in control, not only over his people, but also over the plan for his people, which he continues to carry out. He wanted them to keep rebuilding. The temple was the heart of his promise. In the Old Testament, God speaks to his people through his prophets. And at this time, the prophet Haggai, he boldly declares to them, your lack of food, your lack of clothing, your shelter problems can all be blamed on the failure to rebuild the temple. The Jews, they listened, they repented, and then they started building again. See, prophets were God's representatives. Their job was to challenge and to support them. Their words would have given the people strength and encouragement to trust the Lord. Remember that his promises are given to them to give them strength and to give them hope, something to hold on to. And then they could have kept working faithfully to rebuilding no matter what. Time passes. The resistance continues. The Samaritans likely were the reason that this high official named Tatanai visited them. So his plan was to gather information and then to go and report back to the new king, King Darius. This potentially could result in danger for the people of Israel because this king is not opposed to threatening life. Tatnai arrived and he asks the Jews, who gave you permission for rebuilding the temple? And then he also takes down the names of all the individual builders. We need to notice their response to government opposition. They did not resist. They submitted to governing authority. And this shows how they trusted God's sovereignty, his ability to be faithful to his promise in spite of government opposition. And we come to this Noteworthy line in verse 5, but the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews. Underline that phrase too. Having the eye of God watching over them, it simply means the Lord took special care on behalf of his people. There are many references in the Bible about the eyes of God. Job 34, 21 
says, for his eyes are on the ways of a man and he sees all his steps. God is all knowing. Because God is a loving, giving God, this truth can bring comfort to those who have a relationship with God. Psalm 33, verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. Having God's eye on them, it did not mean that they were exempt from opposition. But oh, wow, I can't wait to tell you what it did mean. God's eye, God's special care is going to make your mouth drop open. Okay, so the rest of Ezra chapter 5 is a copy of the letter that Tatanai wrote. He explains, the Jews are rebuilding the temple, and then when he questions them, their response is listed in verse 11. It says, we are the servants of the God of heaven and earth. And we are rebuilding the temple that was built many years ago, one that a great king of Israel built and finished. So, of course, they're referring to the temple that was built when King Solomon ruled all of Israel. They continue defending themselves by saying, King Cyrus gave us permission. Obviously, the Jews didn't have a copy of that edict that Cyrus wrote, but it was kept in Babylon. And then this letter requests King Darius to search the archives for that proof. He finds it copies it, and then he sends it back to Tatanai, and he commands him. Look at verse 6, the latter part. It says, Your colleagues and your officials west of the Euphrates River, stay away from there. Do not disturb the construction of the temple of God. Let it be rebuilt on its own original site. Do not hinder the governor of Judah and the elders of the Jews in their work. Moreover, I hereby decree that you are to help these elders of the Jews as they rebuild this temple of God. You must pay for the full construction costs without delay and give the priests in Jerusalem whatever is needed in the way of young bulls, rams, and male lambs for the burnt offerings presented to the God of heaven. And without fail, provide them with as much wheat, salt, wine, and olive oil as they'll need each day. Then they will be able to offer acceptable sacrifices to the God of heaven and pray for the welfare of the king and his sons. Throughout scripture, we read time and time again of the promises of good things for those who are building the holy church, who are building God's house. I love how God just shows up. And how he shows off in this moment. Darius not only tells them to back off, he orders them to pay for everything. It's incredible, right? Those who stand in the way of the Lord, they don't get to forever. Scripture is clear about how they'll end up. God's enemies do not win. King Darius was not going to let the enemies of the people of God win either. He wrote, verse 11, Those who violate this decree in any way will have a beam pulled from their house. Then they will be lifted up and impaled on it, and their house will be reduced to a pile of rubble. May the God who has chosen the city of Jerusalem as the place to honor his name destroy any king or nation that violates this command and destroys this temple. This pronouncement of Darius meant finally an end to the opposition for at least during the time of the rebuilding of the temple. Now, Darius was not an Israelite, so why did he do what he did? Historical documents indicate he had an interest in restoring specific cults that were in his empire. In exchange for his generosity, he simply asks for prayer for him and his family. It's understandable that in a world of polytheism, He just wants to make sure that he was in the favor of every God in his empire. Just like we learned in Ezra chapter 1, God moved the heart of Cyrus, a pagan king, and he does it again with Darius. These kings were instruments of God. I remind you again of Romans 13. There's no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. God is sovereign. 
and he is supreme. And even the mightiest king is in his power. I'm going to quote Pastor Joel. He said, God does what he needs to do. And he moves who he needs to move to let his promises come to pass. Okay, that is a summary. That brings us to the very end of chapter 6. The temple rebuilding is completed. Take a look at verse 16. The temple of God was dedicated with great joy by the people of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the people who had returned from exile. Now, of course, there was great joy. For years, without the temple, God's covenant people, they were unable to sacrifice, to bring offerings the way that they were supposed to. But now, now the people could worship and celebrate the Passover and the festivals, all of those things that defined and reminded them of the promises of God. Okay, what can we learn from these three chapters? Number one, during times of rebuilding, resistance is normal. You should expect it. In the West... Many of us actually have more than we need, which makes us get surprised when there's suffering in life. Delays, failures, and obstacles will happen. If you expect them, it's so much easier to move forward past them. Otherwise, you may get stuck. Our perspective should be to expect resistance, but know where it comes from. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. If this is your view of things, you won't be blindsided, and you won't blame God. So ask God to help you see resistance the way he sees it. Number two, during times of rebuilding, God speaks through his people. Remember, Haggai and Zechariah, they were right beside the exiles during the rebuilding of the temple. If you are personally going through a time where you are facing opposition, don't do what many do. Don't isolate yourself. Don't try and live this life on your own strength. We don't fight it alone. We build together. We need to live our lives relationally connected to Christian community. We need to meet together, to study books like this together. Do you prioritize Sunday church going? Are you in a connect group? You know, at times when there is great resistance to rebuilding, you will get strength to endure by listening to the individuals that God has anointed to teach his word. Number three, during times of rebuilding, God is with his people. The hope from the message of Haggai to the ex exiles, it gave them power. And this power, it comes from the Holy Spirit. Look at Haggai 2, 4 through 5. It says this, for I am with you says the Lord of heaven's armies. My spirit remains among you, just as I promised when you came out of Egypt, so do not be afraid. Once the people of Israel repented of their sin, rather than leaving them alone with the task of rebuilding, Haggai, he continued to preach to the Jews, urging them to focus on the hope of future glory in the temple and a victory that is to come over the enemies of God's people. Haggai 2.9 says, The future glory of this temple will be greater than its past glory, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And in this place, I will bring peace. I, the Lord of heaven's armies, have spoken. His words were pointing to the Savior of the world. When Jesus walked this earth, he regularly faced resistance. And he gives us an example to follow. He spent time in prayer many, many times. It says how he just got away from it all and he spent time alone just talking, talking with God. God's word promises us, it promises us. He listens to us when we pray. 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous 
and his ears are open to their prayer. Prayer is the most powerful resource because it invites the Holy Spirit to join the fight. Most of the time, the battle that we're facing is spiritual. So the truth to cling to is that spiritual battle, that's already been won. Remember John 16, verse 33, Jesus says these words. He says, I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because... I have overcome the world. Now, King Solomon, he built the original temple in seven years. The rebuilding during the time of Ezra, it took three times that. When the people of God are rebuilding, it takes time. God, however, he's a miracle worker. He's a way maker, and he doesn't have to take time. John 2, verse 19, Jesus answers them, Destroy this temple and I will, I will raise it again in three days. The temple, as a physical building, it was imperative to worship. And when it was destroyed, the people of God, they were lost. This is the life-changing truth of what Jesus did on the cross. Because of human rebellion against God, every single person, every one of us is lost and we're distanced from the one who created us. Now, the people of God, they came to the temple. They had to sacrifice animals on the altar to pay the price for their rebellion. But Jesus Christ, when he willingly gave his life on the cross, he did this for us. When Jesus said temple, he was speaking about his own body. So he rebuilt what the temple represents in three days by rising again, by overcoming all resistance. His resurrection defeats all enemies. That's why we can boldly declare the battle belongs to the Lord. And I've learned to trust him and to trust his timetable, especially recently. To propel us as a church towards reaching God's vision for us as Sanctus Church, we became a multi-site many years ago. And with each site launch, a site pastor is selected. And yet our Ajax site, it never had a specific site pastor until the position was offered to me in December 2021. I accepted. And yet the very week that it was going to be announced publicly, I realized I was pregnant. Having a baby would most certainly delay getting to serve in this new role. It would mean sleepless nights some wear and tear on my body. And at 45 years old, it could mean some serious health complications. Now this example in my own life, of course, it's not political opposition and it wasn't a threat or a person intentionally keeping me from stepping up to what God has called me to, but nevertheless, it was an obstacle. It was a delay for me to be a part of the rebuilding What would others in our world do if they were in a similar situation? Ajax's local partner is the Pregnancy Help Center, and I was recently reading a report that they wrote. They said that in our world, about half of the women with an unplanned pregnancy choose abortion. Did you know this, that women who are over 35 will choose abortion more so than those who are closer to the age of 30. Now, please hear me clearly. Abortion was never something I personally considered, but I mention it to say, if I didn't expect resistance to rebuilding, I would have been discouraged about the delay of not working for a whole year. Asking God to give me and to guide my perspective so that I would have the mind of Christ helped me to turn to our community. I relied on others for support and they were the ones who came and prayed for me. So as a result, a year later, there is no doubt that God's eye was on us. We have the happiest one-year-old and she regularly brings a smile to the face of everyone in my house. 
especially my three teenagers who sometimes barely give me a grunt or a nod, but oh, they will ooh and ah and run over to show her how much they care for her and want to see and meet her needs. See, God, he showed up and he showed off. You could say I was forced to delay being a part of the rebuilding that was happening at Sanctus, but I trust at that time God was preparing me or rather rebuilding me, I get to be his instrument as he uses this story, my story, to help others see things like the value of life, the necessity of community, and that he is the giver of good gifts and he still does miracles today. In the New Testament, the temple, it refers to the people of God, his church, this is what we get to rebuild. In rebuilding his church, when resistance comes, remember, opposition is normal. Expect it. Ask God for his perspective of it. We don't fight it alone, but we build together. And most importantly, trust that the battle belongs to our God because he's already defeated every one of your enemies. Let's pray together. Almighty God, you are sovereign over all. And I ask, would you please guide our perspective to expect opposition? Help us to see it how you see it. Oh God, I thank you that your eye is on your people. So as you build, rebuild us individually and then collectively as a church, would you help us to be quick to get on our knees, to come to you in prayer and to trust you in the battle. Would you help us to come together to be one body, to work together towards your mission, to show this world your loving plan of salvation. God, I thank you for hearing my prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.